Chapter Thirteen of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Thirteen. Some new acquaintances are introduced to the intelligent reader, connected with whom various pleasant matters are related, appertaining to this history. Where's Oliver? said the Jew, rising with a menacing look. "'Where's the boy?' The young thieves eyed their preceptor, as if they were alarmed at his violence, and looked uneasily at each other, but they made no reply. "'What's become of the boy?' said the Jew, seizing the Dodger tightly by the collar, and threatening him with horrid imprecations. "'Speak out, or I'll throttle you!' Mr. Fagin looked so very much in earnest, the Charlie Bates, who deemed it prudent in all cases to be on the safe side, and who conceived it by no means improbable that it might be his turn to be throttled second, dropped upon his knees, and raised a loud, well-sustained and continuous roar, something between a mad bull and a speaking-trumpet. "'Will you speak?' thundered the Jew, shaking the Dodger so much that his keeping in the big coat at all seemed perfectly miraculous. "'Why! "'The traps have got him, and that's all about it,' said the Dodger sullenly. "'Come, let go of me, will you?' And swinging himself at one jerk, clean out of the big coat, which he left in the Jew's hands, the Dodger snatched up the toasting-fork, and made a pass at the merry old gentleman's waistcoat, which, if it had taken effect, would have let a little more merriment out, and could have been easily replaced. The Jew stepped back in this emergency, with more agility than could have been anticipated in a man of his apparent decrepitude, and, seizing up the pot, prepared to hurl it at his assailant's head. But Charlie Bates, at this moment, calling his attention by a perfectly terrific howl, he suddenly altered its destination, and flung it full at that young gentleman. "'Why, what the blazes is in the wind now?' growled a deep voice. "'Who pitched that ear at me?' It's well it's beer, and not the pot as it me, or I'd have settled somebody. I might have knowed, as nobody but an infernal, rich, plundering, thundering old Jew could afford to throw away any drink but water, and not that, unless he'd done the river company every quarter. What's it all about, Fagin? Damn me if my neck handkerchief ain't lined with beer. Come in. You sneaking warmint! What are you stopping outside for? As if you was ashamed of your master. Come in!" The man who growled out these words was a stoutly built fellow of about five-and-thirty, in a black velveteen coat, very soiled drab breeches, lace-up half-boots, and grey cotton stockings which enclosed a bulky pair of legs with large swelling calves, the kind of legs which in such costume always look in an unfinished and incomplete state, without a set of fetters to garnish them. He had a brown hat on his head, and a dirty belcher handkerchief round his neck, with the long frayed ends of which he smeared the beer from his face as he spoke. He disclosed, when he had done so, a broad, heavy countenance with a beard of three days' growth, and two scowling eyes, one of which displayed various party-coloured symptoms of having been recently damaged by a blow. "'Come in, dear, here,' growled this engaging ruffian. A white shaggy dog, with his face scratched and torn in twenty different places, skulked into the room. "'Why didn't you come in afore?' said the man. "'You're getting too proud to own me afore company, are you? Lie down!' This command was accompanied with a kick, which sent the animal to the other end of the room. He appeared well used to it, however for he coiled himself up in a corner very quietly, without uttering a sound, and winking his very ill-looking eyes twenty times in a minute, appeared to occupy himself in taking a survey of the apartment. "'What are you up to? Ill-treating the boys, you covetous, avaricious, insatiable old fence,' said the man, seating himself deliberately. "'I wonder they don't murder you. I would, if I was them.' If I'd been your prentice, I'd have done it long ago, and—no, 
I couldn't have sold you afterwards, for you're fit for nothing but keeping as a curiosity of ugliness in a glass bottle, and I suppose they don't blow glass bottles large enough. Hush, hush, Mr. Sykes, said the Jew, trembling. Don't speak so loud. None of your mistering, replied the ruffian. You always mean mischief when you come that. You know my name. Out with it. I shan't disgrace it when the time comes. Well, well, then, Bill Sykes, said the Jew, with abject humility. You seem out of humour, Bill. Perhaps I am, replied Sykes. I should think you was rather out of sorts, too, unless you mean as little arm when you throw pewter pots about as you do when you blab and— Are you mad? said the Jew, catching the man by the sleeve and pointing towards the boys. Mr. Sykes contented himself with tying an imaginary knot under his left ear, and jerking his head over on the right shoulder, a piece of dumb show which the Jew appeared to understand perfectly. He then— in cant terms, with which his whole conversation was plentifully besprinkled, but which would be quite unintelligible if they were recorded here, demanded a glass of liquor. "'And mind you don't poison it,' said Mr. Sykes, laying his hat upon the table. This was said in jest, but if the speaker could have seen the evil leer with which the Jew bit his pale lip as he turned round to the cupboard, he might have thought the caution not wholly unnecessary or the wish, at all events, to improve upon the distiller's ingenuity, not very far from the old gentleman's merry heart. After swallowing two or three glasses of spirits, Mr. Sykes condescended to take some notice of the young gentleman, which gracious act led to a conversation, in which the cause and manner of Oliver's capture were circumstantially detailed, with such alterations and improvements on the truth as to the dodger appeared most advisable under the circumstances. "'I'm afraid,' said the Jew, "'that he may say something which will get us into trouble.' "'That's very likely,' returned Sykes with a malicious grin. "'You're blowed upon, Fagin.' "'And I'm afraid, you see,' added the Jew, speaking as if he had not noticed the interruption and regarding the other closely as he did so. "'I'm afraid that, if the game was up with us, it might be up with a good many more, and that it would come out rather worse for you than it would for me, my dear.' The man started, and turned round upon the Jew. But the old gentleman's shoulders were shrugged up to his ears, and his eyes were vacantly staring on the opposite wall. There was a long pause. Every member of the respectable coterie appeared plunged in his own reflections, not excepting the dog, who by a certain malicious licking of his lips seemed to be meditating an attack upon the legs of the first gentleman or lady he might encounter in the streets when he went out. "'Somebody must find out what's been done at the office,' said Mr. Sykes, in a much lower tone than he had taken since he came in. The Jew nodded assent. If he hasn't peached, and is committed, is no fear till he comes out again," said Mr. Sykes, and then he must be taken care on. You must get hold of him somehow." Again the Jew nodded. The prudence of this line of action, indeed, was obvious, but unfortunately there was one very strong objection to its being adopted. This was that the Dodger and Charlie Bates and Fagin and Mr. William Sykes, happened, one and all, to entertain a violent and deeply rooted antipathy to going near a police office on any ground or pretext whatever. How long they might have sat and looked at each other in a state of uncertainty, not the most pleasant of its kind, it is difficult to guess. It is not necessary to make any guesses on the subject, however, for the sudden entrance of the two young ladies, whom Oliver had seen on a former occasion, caused the conversation to flow afresh. "'The very thing,' said the Jew. "'Bet will go, won't you, my dear?' "'Where's?' inquired the young lady. "'Only just up to the office, my dear,' said the Jew, coaxingly. 
It is due to the young lady to say that she did not positively affirm that she would not, but that she merely expressed an emphatic and earnest desire to be blessed if she would, a polite and delicate evasion of the request, which shows the young lady to have been possessed of that natural good breeding which cannot bear to inflict upon a fellow creature the pain of a direct and pointed refusal. The Jew's countenance fell. He turned from this young lady, who was gaily, not to say gorgeously attired, in a red gown, green boots, and yellow curl-papers, to the other female. "'Nancy, my dear,' said the Jew, in a soothing manner, "'what do you say?' "'That it won't do, so it's no use of trying it on, Fagin,' replied Nancy. "'What do you mean by that?' said Mr. Sykes, looking up in a surly manner. "'What I say, Bill?' replied the lady collectedly. "'Why, you're just the very person for it,' reasoned Mr. Sykes. "'Nobody about here knows anything of you.' "'And as I don't want him to, neither,' replied Nancy, in the same composed manner, "'it's rather more no than yes with me, Bill.' "'She'll go, Fagin,' said Sykes. "'No, she won't, Fagin,' said Nancy. "'Yes, she will, Fagin,' said Sykes and Mr. Sykes was right. By dint of alternate threats, promises, and bribes, the lady in question was ultimately prevailed upon to undertake the commission. She was not, indeed, withheld by the same considerations as her agreeable friend, for, having recently removed into the neighbourhood of Field Lane, from the remote but genteel suburb of Ratcliffe, she was not under the same apprehension of being recognised by any of her numerous acquaintances. Accordingly, with a clean white apron tied over her gown, and her curl-papers tucked up under a straw bonnet, both articles of dress being provided from the Jew's inexhaustible stock, Miss Nancy prepared to issue forth on her errand. "'Stop a minute, my dear,' said the Jew, producing a little covered basket. "'Carry that in one hand. It looks more respectable, my dear. Give her a door-key to carry in her t'other one, Fagin.' said Sykes. It looks real and genuine-like. "'Yes, yes, my dear, so it does,' said the Jew, hanging a large street-door key on the forefinger of the young lady's right hand. "'There, very good, very good indeed, my dear,' said the Jew, rubbing his hands. "'Oh, my brother, my poor dear, sweet, innocent little brother!' exclaimed Nancy, bursting into tears, and wringing the little basket and the street-door key in an agony of distress. "'What has become of him? Where have they taken him to? Oh, do have pity, and tell me what's been done with the dear boy, gentlemen. Do, gentlemen, if you please, gentlemen. Ah!' Having uttered those words in a most lamentable and heartbroken tone, to the immeasurable delight of her hearers, Miss Nancy paused, winked to the company, nodded smilingly round, and disappeared. "'Ah, she's a clever girl, my dears,' said the Jew, turning round to his young friends, and shaking his head gravely, as if in mute admonition to them to follow the bright example they had just beheld. "'She's a honour to her sex,' said Mr. Sykes, filling his glass and smiting the table with his enormous fist. "'Here is her health and wishing they was all like her." While these, and many other encomiums, were being passed on the accomplished Nancy, that young lady made the best of her way to the police office, whither, notwithstanding a little natural timidity consequent upon walking through the streets alone and unprotected, she arrived in perfect safety shortly afterwards. Entering by the back way, she tapped softly with a key at one of the cell doors and listened. There was no sound within, so she coughed and listened again. Still there was no reply, so she spoke. "'Nolly, dear,' murmured Nancy, in a gentle voice, "'Nolly!' There was nobody inside but a miserable, shoeless criminal, who had been taken up for playing the flute, and who, the offence against society having been clearly proved, had been very properly committed by Mr. Fang to the House of Correction for one month 
with the appropriate and amusing remark, that since he had so much breath to spare, it would be more wholesomely expended on the treadmill than in a musical instrument. He made no answer, being occupied mentally bewailing the loss of the flute, which had been confiscated for the use of the county. So Nancy passed on to the next cell, and knocked there. "'Well?' cried a faint and feeble voice. "'Is there a little boy here?' inquired Nancy, with a preliminary sob. "'No,' replied the voice. "'God forbid!' This was a vagrant of sixty-five, who was going to prison for not playing the flute, or, in other words, for begging in the streets, and doing nothing for his livelihood. In the next cell was another man, who was going to the same prison for hawking tin saucepans without license, thereby doing something for his living, in defiance of the stamp office. But as neither of these criminals answered to the name of Oliver, or knew anything about him, Nancy made straight up to the bluff officer in the striped waistcoat, and with the most piteous wailings and lamentations, rendered more piteously by a prompt and efficient use of the street-door key, and the little basket, demanded her own dear brother. "'I haven't got him, my dear,' said the old man. "'Where is he?' screamed Nancy, in a distracted manner. "'Why, the gentleman's got him,' replied the officer. "'What gentleman? Oh, gracious heavens! What gentleman?' exclaimed Nancy. In reply to this incoherent questioning, the old man informed the deeply affected sister that Oliver had been taken ill in the office, and discharged in consequence of a witness having proved the robbery to have been committed by another boy, not in custody, and that the prosecutor had carried him away, in an insensible condition, to his own residence, of and concerning which all the informant knew was that it was somewhere in Pentonville, he having heard that word mentioned in the directions to the coachman. In a dreadful state of doubt and uncertainty, the agonised young woman staggered to the gate, and then, exchanging her faltering walk for a swift run, returned by the most devious and complicated route she could think of, to the domicile of the Jew. Mr. Bill Sykes no sooner heard the account of the expedition delivered, than he very hastily called up the white dog, and, putting on his hat, expeditiously departed, without devoting any time to the formality of wishing the company good morning. "'We must know where he is, my dears. He must be found,' said the Jew, greatly excited. "'Charlie, do nothing but skulk about, till you bring home some news of him. Nancy, my dear, I must have him found. I trust to you, my dear, to you and the artful for everything. Stay, stay,' added the Jew, unlocking a drawer with a shaking hand. "'There's money, my dears. I shall shut up this shop to-night. You'll know where to find me. Don't stop here a minute, not an instant, my dears.' With these words, he pushed them from the room, and carefully double-locking and barring the door behind them, drew from its place of concealment the box which he had unintentionally disclosed to Oliver. Then he hastily proceeded to dispose the watches and jewellery beneath his clothing. A rap at the door startled him in this occupation. "'Who's there?' he cried in a shrill tone. "'Me,' replied the voice of the dodger through the keyhole. "'What now?' cried the Jew impatiently. "'Is he to be kidnapped to the other ken, Nancy says?' inquired the dodger. "'Yes,' replied the Jew. "'Wherever she lays hands on him, find him, find him out, that's all.' I shall know what to do next. Never fear." The boy murmured a reply of intelligence, and hurried downstairs after his companions. "'He has not peached so far,' said the Jew, as he pursued his occupation. "'If he means to blab us among his new friends, we may stop his mouth yet.'" End of chapter 13《ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリンゴ』ハッピーリン
with the remarkable prediction which one Mr. Grimwig uttered concerning him when he went out on an errand. Oliver soon recovering from the fainting fit into which Mr. Brownlow's abrupt exclamation had thrown him, the subject of the picture was carefully avoided, both by the old gentleman and Mrs. Bedwin, in the conversation that ensued, which indeed bore no reference to Oliver's history or prospects, but was confined to such topics as might amuse without exciting him. He was still too weak to get up to breakfast, but when he came down into the housekeeper's room next day, his first act was to cast an eager glance at the wall, in the hope of again looking on the face of the beautiful lady. His expectations were disappointed, however, for the picture had been removed. "'Ah!' said the housekeeper, watching the direction of Oliver's eyes. "'It is gone, you see.' "'I see it is, ma'am,' replied Oliver. "'Why have they taken it away?' "'It has been taken down, child, because Mr. Brownlow said that as it seemed to worry you, perhaps it might prevent your getting well, you know,' rejoined the old lady. "'Oh, no, indeed. It didn't worry me, ma'am,' said Oliver. "'I liked to see it. I quite loved it.' "'Well, well,' said the old lady, good-humouredly, "'you get well as fast as ever you can, dear, and it shall be hung up again. There, I promise you that. Now let us talk about something else.' This was all the information Oliver could obtain about the picture at that time. As the old lady had been so kind to him in his illness, he endeavoured to think no more of the subject just then. So he listened attentively to a great many stories she told him, about an amiable and handsome daughter of hers, who was married to an amiable and handsome man, and lived in the country, and about a son, who was a clerk to a merchant in the West Indies, and who was also such a good young man and wrote such dutiful letters home four times a year, that it brought the tears into her eyes to talk about them. When the old lady had expatiated a long time, on the excellences of her children, and the merits of her kind good husband besides, who had been dead and gone, poor dear soul, just six and twenty years, it was time to have tea. After tea she began to teach Oliver Cribbage, which he learned as quickly as she could teach and at which game they played with great interest and gravity, until it was time for the invalid to have some warm wine and water, with a slice of dry toast, and then to go cosily to bed. They were happy days, those of Oliver's recovery. Everything was so quiet and neat and orderly, everybody so kind and gentle, that after the noise and turbulence in the midst of which he had always lived, it seemed like heaven itself. He was no sooner strong enough to put his clothes on properly, and Mr. Brownlow caused a complete new suit, and a new cap, and a new pair of shoes, to be provided for him. As Oliver was told that he might do what he liked with the old clothes, he gave them to a servant, who had been very kind to him, and asked her to sell them to a Jew, and keep the money for herself. This she very readily did. And as Oliver looked out of the parlour window, and saw the Jew roll them up in his bag and walk away, he felt quite delighted to think that they were safely gone, and that there was now no possible danger of his ever being able to wear them again. They were sad rags, to tell the truth, and Oliver had never had a new suit before. One evening, about a week after the affair of the picture, as he was sitting talking to Mrs. Bedwin, there came a message down from Mr. Brownlow, that if Oliver Twist felt pretty well, he should like to see him in his study, and talk to him a little while. "'Bless us, and save us! Wash your hands, and let me part your hair nicely for you, child,' said Mrs. Bedwin. "'Dear heart alive! If we had known he would have asked for you, we would have put you a clean collar on, and made you as smart as sixpence.' Oliver did as the old lady bade him, and although she lamented grievously, meanwhile, that there was not even time to crimp the little frill that bordered his shirt-collar, he looked so delicate and handsome, despite that important personal advantage, had she went so far as to say, looking at him with great complacency from head to foot, that she really didn't think it would have been possible, on the longest notice, to have made much difference in him for the better. Thus encouraged, Oliver tapped at the study door. On Mr. Brownlow calling to him to come in, he found himself in a little back room, quite full of books, with a window looking into some pleasant little gardens. There was a table drawn up before the window, at which Mr. Brownlow was seated reading. 
When he saw Oliver, he pushed the book away from him, and told him to come near the table and sit down. Oliver complied, marvelling where the people could be found to read such a great number of books as seemed to be written to make the world wiser, which is still a marvel to more experienced people than Oliver Twist, every day of their lives. "'There are a good many books, are there not, my boy?' said Mr. Brownlow, observing the curiosity with which Oliver surveyed the shelves that reached from the floor to the ceiling. "'A great number, sir,' replied Oliver. "'I never saw so many.' "'You shall read them, if you behave well,' said the old gentleman kindly, "'and you will like that, better than looking at the outsides—that is, some cases.' "'because there are books of which the backs and covers are by far the best parts.' "'I suppose they are those heavy ones, sir,' said Oliver, pointing to some large quartos, with a good deal of gilding about the binding. "'Not always those,' said the old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head, and smiling as he did so. "'There are other equally heavy ones, though of a much smaller size.' How should you like to grow up a clever man, and write books, eh?" "'I think I would rather read them, sir,' replied Oliver. "'What? Wouldn't you like to be a book-writer?' said the old gentleman. Oliver considered a little while, and at last said he should think it would be a much better thing to be a bookseller, upon which the old gentleman laughed heartily, and declared he had said a very good thing which Oliver felt glad to have done, though he by no means knew what it was. "'Well, well,' said the old gentleman, composing his features, "'don't be afraid. We won't make an author of you, while there's an honest trade to be learnt, or brick-making to turn to.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Oliver. At the earnest manner of his reply, the old gentleman laughed again, and said something about a curious instinct which Oliver, not understanding, paid no very great attention to. "'Now,' said Mr. Brownlow, speaking if possible in a kinder, but at the same time in a much more serious manner than Oliver had ever known him assume yet, "'I want you to pay great attention, my boy, to what I am going to say. I shall talk to you without any reserve, because I am sure you are well able to understand me, as many older persons would be.' "'Oh, don't tell you are going to send me away, sir, pray!' exclaimed Oliver, alarmed at the serious tone of the old gentleman's commencement. "'Don't turn me out of doors to wander in the streets again. Let me stay here, and be a servant. Don't send me back to the wretched place I came from. Have mercy upon a poor boy, sir.' "'My dear child,' said the old gentleman, moved by the warmth of Oliver's sudden appeal, "'You need not be afraid of my deserting you, unless you give me cause.' "'I never, never will, sir,' interposed Oliver. "'I hope not,' rejoined the old gentleman. "'I do not think you ever will. I have been deceived before in the objects whom I have endeavoured to benefit, but I feel strongly disposed to trust you, nevertheless.' and I am more interested in your behalf than I can well account for, even to myself. The persons on whom I have bestowed my dearest love lie deep in their graves, but although the happiness and delight of my life lie buried there too, I have not made a coffin of my heart, and sealed it up for ever on my best affections. Deep affliction has but strengthened and refined them. As the old gentleman said this in a low voice, more to himself than to his companion, and as he remained silent for a short time afterwards, Oliver sat quite still. "'Well, well,' said the old gentleman at length, in a more cheerful tone, "'I only say this because you have a young heart, and knowing that I have suffered great pain and sorrow, you will be more careful, perhaps, not to wound me again. You say you are an orphan, without a friend in the world. All the inquiries I have been able to make confirm the statement. Let me hear your story, where you come from, who brought you up, and how you got into the company in which I found you. Speak the truth, 
and you shall not be friendless while I live." Oliver's sobs checked his utterance for some minutes. When he was on the point of beginning to relate how he had been brought up at the farm, and carried to the workhouse by Mr. Bumble, a peculiarly impatient little double-knock was heard at the street door, and the servant, running upstairs, announced Mr. Grimwig. "'Is he coming up?' inquired Mr. Brownlow. "'Yes, sir,' replied the servant. He asked if there were any muffins in the house, and when I told him yes, he said he had come to tea." Mr. Brownlow smiled, and turning to Oliver, said that Mr. Grimwig was an old friend of his, and he must not mind his being a little rough in his manners, for he was a worthy creature at bottom, as he had reason to know. "'Shall I go downstairs, sir?' inquired Oliver. "'No,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'I would rather you remained here.' At this moment, they walked into the room, supporting himself by a thick stick, a stout old gentleman, rather lame in one leg, who was dressed in a blue coat, striped waistcoat, nankeen breeches, and gaiters, and a broad-brimmed white hat with the sides turned up with green. A very small plaited shirt-frill stuck out from his waistcoat, and a very long steel watch-chain, with nothing but a key at the end, dangled loosely below it. The ends of his white neckerchief were twisted into a ball about the size of an orange. The variety of shapes into which his countenance was twisted defy description. He had a manner of screwing his head on one side when he spoke, and of looking out of the corners of his eyes at the same time, which irresistibly reminded the beholder of a parrot. In this attitude he fixed himself the moment he made his appearance, and, holding out a small piece of orange peel at arm's length, exclaimed in a growling, discontented voice, "'Look here! Do you see this? Isn't it a most wonderful and extraordinary thing that I can't call at a man's house, but I find a piece of this poor surgeon's friend on the staircase? I've been lamed with orange peel once, and I know orange peel will be my death, or I'll be content to eat my own head, sir." This was the handsome offer with which Mr. Grimwig backed and confirmed nearly every assertion he made, and it was the more singular in his case because even admitting, for the sake of argument, the possibility of scientific improvements being brought to that pass which will enable a gentleman to eat his own head, in the event of his being so disposed, Mr. Grimwig's head was such a particularly large one, that the most sanguine man alive could hardly entertain a hope of being able to get through it at a sitting, to put entirely out of the question a very thick coating of powder. "'I'll eat my head, sir,' repeated Mr. Grimwig striking a stick upon the ground. "'Hello! What's that?' Looking at Oliver, and retreating a pace or two. "'This is young Oliver Twist, whom we were speaking about,' said Mr. Brownlow. Oliver bowed. "'You don't mean to say that's the boy who had the fever, I hope?' said Mr. Grimwig, recalling a little more. "'Wait a minute. Don't speak. Stop!' continued Mr. Grimwig, abruptly losing all dread of the fever in his triumph at the discovery that's the boy who had the orange. If that's not the boy, sir, who had the orange, and threw this bit of peel upon the staircase, I'll eat my head and his too. No, no, he has not had one," said Mr. Brownlow, laughing. Come, put down your hat and speak to my young friend. I feel strongly on this subject, sir," said the irritable old gentleman, drawing off his gloves. There's always more or less, orange peel on the pavement in our street, and I know it's put there by the surgeon's boy at the corner. A young woman stumbled over a bit last night, and fell against my garden railings. Directly she got up, I saw her look towards his infernal red lamp with the pantomime light. "'Don't go to him!' I called out of the window. "'He's an assassin! A man-trap!' "'So he is. If he is not, here the irascible old gentleman gave a great knock on the ground with his stick, which was always understood by his friends to imply the customary offer whenever it was not expressed in words. Then, still keeping his stick in his hand, he sat down, and opening a double eyeglass, which he wore attached to a broad black ribband, took a view of Oliver, who, seeing that he was the object of inspection, coloured and bowed again. "'That's the boy, is it?' said Mr. Grimwig at length. "'That's the boy,' replied Mr. Brownlow. 
How are you, boy? said Mr. Grimwig. A great deal better, thank you, sir, replied Oliver. Mr. Brownlow, seeming to apprehend that his singular friend was about to say something disagreeable, asked Oliver to step downstairs and tell Mrs. Bedwin they were ready for tea, which, as he did not half like the visitor's manner, he was very happy to do. "'He is a nice-looking boy, is he not?' inquired Mr. Brownlow. "'I don't know,' replied Mr. Grimwig pettishly. "'Don't know? No, I don't know. I never see any difference in boys. I only knew two sort of boys—mealy boys and beef-faced boys.' "'And which is Oliver?' "'Mealy. I know a friend who was a beef-faced boy, a fine boy, they call him, with a round head, and red cheeks, and glaring eyes, a horrid boy, with a body and limbs that appear to be swelling out of the seams of his blue clothes, with the voice of a pilot, and the appetite of a wolf. I know him, the wretch!' "'Come,' said Mr. Brownlow, "'these are not the characteristics of young Oliver Twist so he needn't excite your wrath." "'They are not,' replied Mr. Grimwig. "'He may have worse.' Here Mr. Brownlow coughed impatiently, which appeared to afford Mr. Grimwig the most exquisite delight. "'He may have worse, I say,' repeated Mr. Grimwig. "'Where does he come from? Who is he? What is he? He has had a fever. What of that? Fevers are not peculiar to good people, are they?' Bad people have fevers sometimes, haven't they, eh? I knew a man who was hung in Jamaica for murdering his master. He had had a fever six times. He wasn't recommended to mercy on that account. Pooh! Nonsense!" Now the fact was, that in the inmost recesses of his own heart, Mr. Grimwig was strongly disposed to admit that Oliver's appearance and manner were unusually prepossessing. But he had a strong appetite for contradiction sharpened on this occasion by the finding of the orange peel, and, inwardly determining that no man should dictate to him whether a boy was well-looking or not, he had resolved, from the first, to oppose his friend. When Mr. Brownlow admitted that on no one point of inquiry could he yet return a satisfactory answer, and that he had postponed any investigation into Oliver's previous history until he thought the boy was strong enough to hear it, Mr. Grimwig chuckled maliciously and he demanded, with a sneer, whether the housekeeper was in the habit of counting the plate at night, because if she didn't find a tablespoon or two missing some sunshiny morning, why, he would be content to—and so forth. All this Mr. Brownlow, although himself somewhat of an impetuous gentleman, knowing his friend's peculiarities, bore with great good humour, as Mr. Grimwig, at tea, was graciously pleased to express his entire approval of the muffins matters went on very smoothly. And Oliver, who made one of the party, began to feel more at his ease than he had yet done in the fierce old gentleman's presence. "'And when are you going to hear a full, true, and particular account of the life and adventures of Oliver Twist?' asked Mr. Grimwig of Mr. Brownlow, at the conclusion of the meal, looking sideways at Oliver as he resumed his subject. "'Tomorrow morning,' replied Mr. Brownlow. I would rather he was alone with me at the time. Come up to me to-morrow morning at ten o'clock, my dear." "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver. He answered with some hesitation, because he was confused by Mr. Grimwig's looking so hard at him. "'I'll tell you what,' whispered that gentleman to Mr. Brownlow. "'He won't come up to you to-morrow morning. I saw him hesitate. He is deceiving you, my good friend.' "'I'll swear he is not,' replied Mr. Brownlow warmly. "'If he is not,' said Mr. Grimwig, "'I'll—' and down went the stick. "'I'll answer for that boy's truth with my life,' said Mr. Brownlow, knocking the table. "'And I for his falsehood with my head,' rejoined Mr. Grimwig, knocking the table also. "'We shall see,' said Mr. Brownlow, checking his rising anger. "'We will,' replied Mr. Grimwig, with a provoking smile. "'We will.' As fate would have it, Mrs. Bedwin chanced to bring in, at this moment, a small parcel of books, which Mr. Brownlow had that morning purchased of the identical bookstall-keeper, who has already figured in this history. Having laid them on the table, she prepared to leave the room. "'Stop the boy, Mrs. Bedwin,' 
said Mr. Brownlow, there is something to go back. He is gone, sir, replied Mrs. Bedwin. Call after him, said Mr. Brownlow. It's particular. He is a poor man, and they are not paid for. There are some books to be taken back, too. The street door was opened. Oliver ran one way, and the girl ran another, and Mrs. Bedwin stood on the step and screamed for the boy, but there was no boy in sight. Oliver and the girl returned, in a breathless state, to report that there were no tidings of him. "'Dear me! I am very sorry for that,' exclaimed Mr. Brownlow. "'I particularly wish those books to be returned to-night.' "'Send Oliver with them,' said Mr. Grimwig with an ironical smile. He'll be sure to deliver them safely, you know." "'Yes. Do let me take them, if you please, sir,' said Oliver. "'I'll run all the way, sir.' The old gentleman was just going to say that Oliver should not go out on any account, when a most malicious cough from Mr. Grimwig determined him that he should, and that, by his prompt discharge of the commission, he should prove to him the injustice of his suspicions on this head at least, at once. "'You shall go, my dear,' said the old gentleman. "'The books are on a chair by my table. Fetch them down.' Oliver, delighted to be of use, brought down the books under his arm in a great bustle, and waited, cap in hand, to hear what message he was to take. "'You are to say,' said Mr. Brownlow, glancing steadily at Grimwig, "'you are to say that you have brought those books back.' and that you have come to pay the four pound ten i owe him this is a five pound note so you will have to bring me back ten shillings change i won't be ten minutes sir said oliver eagerly having buttoned up the bank-note in his jacket pocket and placed the books carefully under his arm he made a respectful bow and left the room mrs bedwin followed him to the street door giving him many directions about the nearest way and the name of the bookseller, and the name of the street, all of which Oliver said he clearly understood. Having superadded many injunctions to be sure and not take cold, the old lady at length permitted him to depart. "'Bless his sweet face,' said the old lady, looking after him. "'I can't bear somehow to let him go out of my sight.' At this moment Oliver looked gaily round, and nodded before he turned the corner. The old lady smilingly returned his salutation, and, closing the door, went back to her own room. "'Let me see. He'll be back in twenty minutes at the longest,' said Mr. Brownlow, pulling out his watch and placing it on the table. "'It will be dark by that time.' "'Oh! <laughs> you really expect him to come back, do you?' inquired Mr. Grimwig. "'Don't you?' asked Mr. Brownlow, smiling. The spirit of contradiction was strong in Mr. Grimwig's breast at the moment, and it was rendered stronger by his friend's confident smile. "'No,' he said, smiting the table with his fist. "'I do not. The boy is a new suit of clothes on his back, a set of valuable books under his arm, and a five-pound note in his pocket. He'll join his old friends the thieves and laugh at you. If ever that boy returns to this house, sir, I'll eat my head.' With these words, he drew his chair closer to the table, and there the two friends sat, in silent expectation, with the watch between them. It is worthy of remark, as illustrating the importance we attach to our own judgments, and the pride with which he put forth our most rash and hasty conclusions, that although Mr. Grimwig was not by any means a bad-hearted man, and though he would have been unfeignedly sorry to see his respected friend duped and deceived, he really did most earnestly and strongly hope, at that moment, that Oliver Twist might not come back. It grew so dark, that the figures on the dial-plate were scarcely discernible. But there the two old gentlemen continued to sit in silence, with the watch between them. End of chapter 14「of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 15. Showing how very fond of Oliver Twist, 
the merry old Jew and Miss Nancy were. In the obscure parlour of a low public house, in the filthiest part of Little Saffron Hill, a dark and gloomy den, where a flaring gaslight burnt all day in the winter-time, and where no ray of sun ever shone in the summer, there sat, brooding over a little pewter measure, and a small glass, strongly impregnated with the smell of liquor, a man in a velveteen coat, drab shorts, half-boots and stockings, whom even by that dim light no experienced agent of the police would have hesitated to recognise as Mr. William Sykes. At his feet sat a white-coated red-eyed dog, who occupied himself alternately in winking at his master with both eyes at the same time, and in licking a large, fresh cut on one side of his mouth, which appeared to be the result of some recent conflict. "'Keep quiet, you warmint! Keep quiet!' said Mr. Sykes, suddenly breaking silence. Whether his meditations were so intense as to be disturbed by the dog's winking, or whether his feelings were so wrought upon by his reflections that they required all the relief derivable from kicking an unoffending animal, to allay them, is matter for argument and consideration. Whatever was the cause, the effect was a kick and a curse bestowed upon the dog simultaneously. Dogs are not generally apt to revenge injuries inflicted upon them by their masters, but Mr. Sykes's dog, having faults of temper in common with his owner, and labouring perhaps at this moment under a powerful sense of injury, made no more ado, but at once fixed his teeth in one of the half-boots. Having given it a hearty shake, he retired, growling under a form, just escaping the pewter measure which Mr. Sykes levelled at his head. "'You would, would you?' said Sykes, seizing the poker in one hand, and deliberately opening with the other a large clasp-knife, which he drew from his pocket. "'Come here, you born devil! Come here! Do you hear?' The dog no doubt heard, because Mr. Sykes spoke in the very harshest key of a very harsh voice, but appearing to entertain some unaccountable objection to having his throat cut, he remained where he was, and growled more fiercely than before, at the same time grasping the end of the poker between his teeth, and biting at it like a wild beast. This resistance only infuriated Mr. Sykes the more, who, dropping on his knees, began to assail the animal most furiously. The dog jumped from right to left, and from left to right, snapping, growling, and barking. The man thrust and swore, and struck and blasphemed, and the struggle was reaching a most critical point for one or other, when, the door suddenly opening, the dog darted out, leaving Bill Sykes with the poker and the clasp-knife in his hands. "'There must always be two parties to a quarrel,' says the old adage. Mr. Sykes, being disappointed of the dog's participation, at once transferred his share in the quarrel to the newcomer. "'What the devil do you come in between me and my dog for?' said Sykes, with a fierce gesture. "'I didn't know, my dear. I didn't know,' replied Fagin humbly, for the Jew was the newcomer. "'Didn't know, you white-livered thief!' growled Sykes. "'Couldn't you hear the noise?' "'Not a sound of it, as I'm a living man, Bill,' replied the Jew. "'Oh, no! You hear nothing, you don't,' retorted Sykes with a fierce sneer. "'Sneaking in and out, so as nobody hears how you come or go. I wish you had been the dog, Fagin, half a minute ago.' "'Why?' inquired the Jew, with a forced smile. "'Course the government as cares for the lives of such men as you, as having half the pluck of curs, lets a man kill a dog how he likes," replied Sykes, shutting up the knife with a very expressive look. "'That's why!' The Jew rubbed his hands, and, sitting down at the table, affected to laugh at the pleasantry of his friend. He was obviously very ill at ease, however. "'Grin away!' said Sykes, replacing the poker and surveying him with savage contempt. "'Grin away! You'll never have the laugh at me, though, unless it's behind a nightcap. I've got the upper hand over you, Fagin, and damn me, I'll keep it. There! If I go, you go. So take care of me.' 
"'Well, well, my dear,' said the Jew, "'I know all that. We, we have a mutual interest, Bill. A mutual interest.' <laughs> said Sykes, as if he thought the interest lay rather more on the Jew's side than on his. "'Well, what have you got to say to me?' "'It's all passed safe through the melting pot,' replied Fagin, "'and this is your share. It's rather more than it ought to be, my dear, but as I know you'll do me a good turn another time, and stow that gammon,' interposed the robber impatiently, "'where is it?' Hand it over. Yes, yes, Bill. Give me time. Give me time, replied the Jew soothingly. Here it is. All safe. As he spoke, he drew forth an old cotton handkerchief from his breast, and untying a large knot in one corner, produced a small brown paper packet. Sykes, snatching it from him, hastily opened it, and proceeded to count the sovereigns it contained. "'This is all, is it?' inquired Sykes. "'All,' replied the Jew. "'You haven't opened the parcel and swallowed one or two as you come along, have you?' inquired Sykes suspiciously. "'Don't put on an injured look at that question. You've done it many a time. Jerk the tinkler.' These words, in plain English, conveyed an injunction to ring the bell. It was answered by another Jew, younger than Fagin, but nearly as vile and repulsive in appearance. Bill Sykes merely pointed to the empty measure. The Jew, perfectly understanding the hint, retired to fill it. Previously exchanging a remarkable look with Fagin, who raised his eyes for an instant, as if in expectation of it, and shook his head in reply. So slightly, that the action would have been almost imperceptible to an observant third person. It was lost upon Sykes who was stooping at the moment to tie the bootlace which the dog had torn. Possibly, if he had observed the brief interchange of signals, he might have thought that it boded no good to him. "'Is anybody here, Barney?' inquired Fagin, speaking now that Sykes was looking on, without raising his eyes from the ground. "'Dot a soul,' replied Barney, whose words, whether they came from the heart or not, made their way through his nose. "'Nobody?' inquired Fagin, in a tone of surprise, which perhaps might mean that Barney was at liberty to tell the truth. "'Nobody but Miss Daisy,' replied Barney. "'Nancy?' exclaimed Sykes. "'Where? Strike me blind if I don't honour that ere girl for her native talents. "'She's bid avid a plate of boiled beef in the bar.' replied Barney. "'Send her here,' said Sykes, pouring out a glass of liquor. "'Send her here.' Barney looked timidly at Fagin, as if for permission. The Jew remaining silent, and not lifting his eyes from the ground, he retired, and presently returned, ushering in Nancy, who was decorated with the bonnet, apron, basket, and street-door key complete. "'You are on the scent, aren't you, Nancy?' inquired Sykes, proffering the glass. "'Yes, I am, Bill,' replied the young lady, disposing of its contents. "'And tired enough of it I am, too. The young brat's been ill and confined to the crib, and—' "'Ah, Nancy, dear,' said Fagin, looking up. Now, whether a peculiar contraction of the Jew's red eyebrows, and a half-closing of his deeply set eyes, warned Miss Nancy that she was disposed to be too communicative, is not a matter of much importance. The fact is all we need care for here, and the fact is that she suddenly checked herself, and with several gracious smiles upon Mr. Sykes, turned the conversation to other matters. In about ten minutes' time, Mr. Fagin was seized with a fit of coughing, upon which Nancy pulled her shawl over her shoulders, and declared it was time to go. Mr. Sykes, finding that he was walking a short part of her way himself, expressed his intention of accompanying her. They went away together, followed at a little distance by the dog, who slunk out of a backyard as soon as his master was out of sight. The Jew thrust his head out of the room door when Sykes had left it, looked after him as he walked up the dark passage, shook his clenched fist, muttered a deep curse, and then, 
with a horrible grin, reseated himself at the table, where he was soon deeply absorbed in the interesting pages of the hue and cry. Meanwhile, Oliver Twist, little dreaming that he was within so very short a distance of the merry old gentleman, was on his way to the bookstall. When he got into Clerkenwell, he accidentally turned down a by-street, which was not exactly in his way, but not discovering his mistake until he had got half-way down it, and knowing it must lead in the right direction, he did not think it worth while to turn back, and so marched on as quickly as he could with the books under his arm. He was walking along, thinking how happy and contented he ought to feel, and how much he would give for only one look at poor little Dick, who, starved and beaten, might be weeping bitterly at that very moment, when he was startled by a young woman screaming out very loud, "'Oh, my dear brother!' And he had hardly looked up to see what the matter was, when he was stopped by having a pair of arms thrown tight round his neck. "'Don't!' cried Oliver, struggling. "'Let go of me! Who is it? What are you stopping me for?' The only reply to this was a great number of loud lamentations from the young woman who had embraced him, and who had a little basket and a street door-key in her hand. "'Oh, my gracious!' said the young woman. "'I have found him! Oh, Oliver! Oliver! Oh, you naughty boy! To make me suffer such distress on your account! Come home, dear, come! Oh, I've found him! Thank gracious goodness heavens, I've found him!' With these incoherent exclamations, the young woman burst into another fit of crying, and got so dreadfully hysterical, that a couple of women who came up at the moment asked a butcher's boy with a shiny head of hair, anointed with suet, who was also looking on, whether he didn't think he had better run for the doctor, to which the butcher's boy, who appeared of a lounging, not to say indolent, disposition, replied that he thought not. "'Oh, no, 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 never mind,' said the young woman grasping Oliver's hand. "'I'm better now. Come home directly, you cruel boy. Come!' "'Oh, ma'am," replied the young woman, "'he ran away, near a month ago, from his parents, who were hard-working and respectable people, and went and joined a set of thieves and bad characters, and almost broke his mother's heart.' "'Young wretch,' said one woman. "'Go home, do you, little brute,' said the other. "'I'm not,' replied Oliver, greatly alarmed. "'I don't know her. I haven't any sister or father or mother either. I'm an orphan. I live at Pentonville.' "'Only hear him! How he braves it out!' cried the young woman. "'Why, it's Nancy!' exclaimed Oliver, who now saw her face for the first time and started back in irrepressible astonishment. "'You see, he knows me,' cried Nancy, appealing to the bystanders. "'He can't help himself. I'll make him come home. There's good people, or he'll kill his dear mother and father and break my heart.' "'What the devil's this?' said a man, bursting out of a beer-shop, with a white dog at his heels. "'Young Oliver, come home to your poor mother, you young dog. "'Come home directly.' I, "'I don't belong to them. I don't know them. Help! Help!' cried Oliver, struggling in the man's powerful grasp. "'Help!' repeated the man. "'Yes, I'll help you, you young rascal. What books are these? You've been a-stealing him, haven't you? Give him here.' With these words, the man tore the volumes from his grasp, and struck him on the head. "'That's right,' cried a looker-on from a garret window. "'That's the only way of bringing him to his senses.' "'To be sure,' cried a sleepy-faced carpenter, casting an approving look at the garret window. "'It'll do him good,' said the two women. "'And he shall have it, too,' rejoined the man, administering another blow, and seizing Oliver by the collar. "'Come on, you young villain! Here, bull's-eye!' Mind him, boy, mind him. Weak with recent illness, stupefied by the blows and the suddenness of the attack, terrified by the fierce growling of the dog and the brutality of the man, overpowered by the conviction of the bystanders that he really was the hardened little wretch he was described to be, what could one poor child do? Darkness had set in, 
It was a low neighbourhood. No help was near. Resistance was useless. In another moment he was dragged into a labyrinth of dark, narrow courts, and was forced along them at a pace which rendered the few cries he dared to give utterance to unintelligible. It was of little moment, indeed, whether they were intelligible or no, for there was nobody to care for them, had they been ever so plain. The gas-lamps were lighted. Mrs. Bedwin was waiting anxiously at the open door. The servant had run up the street twenty times to see if there were any traces of Oliver, and still the two old gentlemen sat, perseveringly, in the dark parlour, with the watch between them. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Sixteen. Relates what became of Oliver Twist after he had been claimed by Nancy. The narrow streets and courts at length terminated in a large open space, scattered about which were pens for beasts and other indications of a cattle market. Sykes slackened his pace when they reached this spot. The girl being quite unable to support any longer the rapid rate at which they had hitherto walked, turning to Oliver, he roughly commanded him to take hold of Nancy's hand. "'Do you hear?' growled Sykes, as Oliver hesitated and looked round. They were in a dark corner, quite out of the track of passengers. Oliver saw, but too plainly, that resistance would be of no avail. He held out his hand which Nancy clasped tight in hers. "'Give me the other,' said Sykes, seizing Oliver's unoccupied hand. "'Here, bullseye!' The dog looked up and growled. "'See here, boy,' said Sykes, putting his other hand to Oliver's throat. "'If he speaks ever so soft a word, hold him. Do you mind?' The dog growled again, and, licking his lips, eyed Oliver as if he were anxious to attach himself to his windpipe without delay. "'He's as willing as a Christian. Strike me blind if he isn't,' said Sykes, regarding the animal with a kind of grim and ferocious approval. "'Now, you know what you've got to expect, master. So crawl away as quick as you like. The dog will soon stop that game. Get on, young un. Bullseye wagged his tail in acknowledgment of this unusually endearing form of speech, and, giving vent to another admonitory growl for the benefit of Oliver, led the way onward. It was Smithfield that they were crossing, although it might have been Grosvenor Square, for anything Oliver knew to the contrary. The night was dark and foggy. The lights in the shops could scarcely struggle through the heavy mist, which thickened every moment, and shrouded the streets and houses in gloom rendering the strange place still stranger in Oliver's eyes, and making his uncertainty the more dismal and depressing. They had hurried on a few paces, when a deep church bell struck the hour. With its first stroke, his two conductors stopped, and turned their heads in the direction whence the sound proceeded. "'Eight o'clock, Bill,' said Nancy, when the bell ceased. "'What's the good of telling me that? I can hear it, can't I?' replied Sykes. "'I wonder whether they can hear it,' said Nancy. "'Of course they can,' replied Sykes. "'It was Bartlemy time, when I was shopped, and there wa'n't a penny chump in the affair, as I couldn't hear the squeaking on. After I was locked up for the night, the row and din outside made the thundering old jail so silent that I could almost have beat my brains out against the iron plates of the door.' "'Poor fellow!' said Nancy, who still had her face turned towards the quarter in which the bell had sounded. "'Oh, Bill! Such fine young chaps as them!' "'Yes, that's all you women think of,' answered Sykes. "'Fine young chaps! Well, they're as good as dead, so it don't much matter.' With this consolation, Mr. Sykes appeared to repress a rising tendency to jealousy, and, clasping Oliver's wrist more firmly, told him to step out again. "'Wait a minute,' said the girl. "'I wouldn't hurry by. If it was you that was coming out to be hung, the next time eight o'clock struck, Bill, I'd walk round and round the place till I dropped 
if the snow was on the ground and I hadn't a short to cover me. "'And what good would that do?' inquired the unsentimental Mr. Sykes. "'Unless you could pitch over a file, and twenty yards of good stout rope, you might as well be walking fifty mile off, or not walking at all, for all the good it would do me. Come on, and don't stand preaching there.' The girl burst into a laugh drew her shawl more closely round her, and they walked away. But Oliver felt her hand tremble, and, looking up in her face as they passed a gas-lamp, saw that it had turned a deathly white. They walked on, by little frequented and dirty ways, for a full half-hour, meeting very few people, and those appearing from their looks to hold much the same position in society as Mr. Sykes himself. At length, they turned into a very filthy narrow street, nearly full of old clothes shops, the dog running forward, as if conscious that there was no further occasion for his keeping on guard, stopped before the door of a shop that was closed, and apparently untenanted. The house was in a ruinous condition, and on the door was nailed a board, intimating that it was to let, which looked as if it had hung there for many years. "'All right,' cried Sykes, glancing cautiously about. Nancy stooped below the shutters, and Oliver heard the sound of a bell. They crossed to the opposite side of the street, and stood for a few moments under a lamp. A noise, as if a sash window were gently raised, was heard, and soon afterwards the door softly opened. Mr. Sykes then seized the terrified boy by the collar with very little ceremony, and all three were quickly inside the house. The passage was perfectly dark. They waited while the person who had let them in chained and barred the door. "'Anybody here?' inquired Sykes. "'No,' replied a voice which Oliver thought he had heard before. "'Is the old un here?' asked the robber. "'Yes,' replied the voice. "'And precious down in the mouth he has been. Won't he be glad to see you? <laughs> oh, no!' The style of this reply, as well as the voice which delivered it, seemed familiar to Oliver's ears but it was impossible to distinguish even the form of the speaker in the darkness. "'Let's have a glim,' said Sykes, "'or we shall go breaking our necks or treading on the dog. Look after your legs if you do.' "'Stand still a moment, and I'll get you one,' replied the voice. The receding footsteps of the speaker were heard, and, in another minute, the form of Mr. John Dawkins, otherwise the artful dodger, appeared. He bore in his right hand a tallow candle stuck in the end of a cleft stick. The young gentleman did not stop to bestow any other remark of recognition upon Oliver than a humorous grin, but, turning away, beckoned the visitors to follow him down a flight of stairs. They crossed an empty kitchen, and, opening the door of a low earthy-smelling room, which seemed to have been built in a small back yard, were received with a shout of laughter. "'Oh, my wig! My wig!' cried Master Charles Bates, from whose lungs the laughter had proceeded. "'Here he is! Oh, cry, here he is! Oh, Fagin, look at him! <laughs> Fagin, do look at him! I can't bear it! He's such a jolly game! I can't bear it! Hold me, somebody, while I laugh it out!' With this irrepressible ebullition of mirth, Master Bates laid himself flat on the floor, and kicked convulsively for five minutes, in an ecstasy of facetious joy. Then, jumping to his feet, he snatched the cleft stick from the dodger, and, advancing to Oliver, viewed him round and round, while the Jew, taking off his nightcap, made a great number of low bows to the bewildered boy. The artful, meantime, who was of a rather saturnine disposition, and seldom gave way to merriment when it interfered with business, rifled Oliver's pockets with steady assiduity. "'Look at his togs, Fagin,' said Charlie, putting the light so close to his new jacket as nearly to set him on fire. "'Look at his togs! Suit with fine cloth, and the heavy swell cut. Oh, my eye, what a game! And his books, too! Nothing but a gentleman, Fagin!' "'Delighted to see you looking so well, my dear,' said the Jew, bowing with mock humility. "'The artful!' shall give you another suit, my dear, for fear you should spoil that Sunday one. 
"'Why didn't you write, my dear, and say you were coming? We'd have got something warm for supper.' At this, Master Bates roared again, so loud that Fagin himself relaxed, and even the Dodger smiled. But as the artful drew forth the five-pound note at that instant, it is doubtful whether the sally of the discovery awakened his merriment. "'Hello! What's that?' inquired Sykes, stepping forward as the Jew seized the note. "'That's mine, Fagin.' "'No, no, my dear,' said the Jew. "'Mine, Bill, mine. You shall have the books. If that ain't mine,' said Bill Sykes, putting on his hat with a determined air, "'mine and Nancy's, that is. I'll take the boy back again.' The Jew started. Oliver started, too though from a very different cause, for he hoped that the dispute might really end in his being taken back. "'Come, and over, will you?' said Sykes. "'This is hardly fair, Bill. Hardly fair, is it, Nancy?' inquired the Jew. "'Fair or not fair,' retorted Sykes, "'and over, I tell you. Do you think Nancy and me's got nothing else to do with our precious time but to spend it in scouting arter and kidnapping every young boy as gets grabbed through you? Give it here, you avaricious old skeleton. Give it here. With this gentle remonstrance, Mr. Sykes plucked the note from between the Jew's finger and thumb, and looking the old man coolly in the face, folded it up small and tied it in his neckerchief. That's for our share of the trouble said Sykes, and not half enough neither. You may keep the books, if you're fond of reading. If you ain't, sell em. "'They're very pretty,' said Charlie Bates, who, with sundry grimaces, had been affecting to read one of the volumes in question. "'Beautiful writing, isn't it, Oliver?' At sight of the dismayed look with which Oliver regarded his tormentors, Master Bates, who was blessed with the lively sense of the ludicrous, fell into another ecstasy more boisterous than the first. "'They belong to the old gentleman,' said Oliver, wringing his hands, "'to the good, kind old gentleman, who took me into his house, and had me nursed when I was near dying of the fever. Oh, pray, send them back. Send him back the books and money. Keep me here all my life long, but pray, pray, send them back. He'll think I stole them. The old lady—' All of them who were so kind to me will think I stole them. Oh, do have mercy upon me, and send them back." With these words, which were uttered with all the energy of passionate grief, Oliver fell upon his knees at the Jew's feet, and beat his hands together in perfect desperation. "'The boy's right,' remarked Fagin, looking covertly round, and knitting his shaggy eyebrows into a hard knot. "'You're right, Oliver. You're right. They will think you have stolen them. <laughs> chuckled the Jew, rubbing his hands. "'It couldn't have happened better if we had chosen our time.' "'Of course it couldn't,' replied Sykes. "'I knowed that. Directly I see him coming through Clerkenwell with the books under his arm. It's all right enough.' They're soft-hearted psalm-singers, or they wouldn't have taken him in at all, and they'll ask no questions after him, fear they should be obliged to prosecute, and so get him lagged. He's safe enough." Oliver had looked from one to the other, while these words were being spoken, as if he were bewildered, and could scarcely understand what passed. But when Bill Sykes concluded, he jumped suddenly to his feet, and tore wildly from the room uttering shrieks for help, which made the bare old house echo to the roof. "'Keep keep back the dog, Bill!' cried Nancy, springing before the door, and closing it, as the Jew and his two pupils darted out in pursuit. "'Keep back the dog! He'll tear the boy to pieces!' "'Serve him right!' cried Sykes, struggling to disengage himself from the girl's grasp. "'Stand off from me, or I'll split your head against the wall!' "'I don't care for that, Bill!' "'I don't care for that!' screamed the girl, struggling violently with the man. "'The child shan't be torn down by the dog, unless you kill me first. "'Shan't he?' said Sykes, setting his teeth. 
I'll soon do that if you don't keep off. The housebreaker flung the girl from him to the farther end of the room, just as the Jew and the two boys returned, dragging Oliver among them. "'What's the matter here?' said Fagin, looking round. "'A girl's gone mad, I think,' replied Sykes savagely. "'No, she hasn't,' said Nancy, pale and breathless from the scuffle. "'No, she hasn't, Fagin. Don't think it.' "'Then keep quiet, will you?' said the Jew, with a threatening look. "'No, I won't do that, neither,' replied Nancy, speaking very loud. "'Come, what do you think of that?' Mr. Fagin was sufficiently well acquainted with the manners and customs of that particular species of humanity to which Nancy belonged, to feel tolerably certain that it would be rather unsafe to prolong any conversation with her at present. With the view of diverting the attention of the company, he turned to Oliver. "'So, you wanted to get away, my dear, did you?' said the Jew, taking up a jagged and knotted club which lay in a corner of the fireplace. "'Eh?' Oliver made no reply, but he watched the Jew's motions, and breathed quickly. "'Wanted to get assistance. Called for the police, did you?' sneered the Jew, catching the boy by the arm. "'We'll cure you of that, my young master.' The Jew inflicted a smart blow on Oliver's shoulders with the club, and was raising it for a second, when the girl, rushing forward, wrested it from his hand. She flung it into the fire, with a force that brought some of the glowing coals whirling out into the room. "'I won't stand by and see it done, Fagin,' cried the girl. "'You've got the boy, and what more would you have? Let him be!' Let him be, or I shall put that mark on some of you that will bring me to the gallows before my time." The girl stamped her foot violently on the floor as she vented this threat, and with her lips compressed and her hands clenched, looked alternately at the Jew and the other robber, her face quite colourless from the passion of rage into which she had gradually worked herself. "'Why, Nancy,' said the Jew, in a soothing tone after a pause during which he and Mr. Sykes had stared at one another in a disconcerted manner, "'You? You're more clever than ever to-night. <laughs> My dear, you are acting beautifully.' "'Am I?' said the girl. "'Take care I don't overdo it. You'll be the worse for it, Fagin, if I do. And so I'll tell you in good time to keep clear of me.' There is something about a roused woman, especially if she add to all of her other strong passions the fierce impulses of recklessness and despair, which few men like to provoke. The Jew saw that it would be hopeless to effect any further mistake regarding the reality of Miss Nancy's rage, and, shrinking involuntarily back a few paces, cast a glance, half imploring and half cowardly, at Sykes, as if to hint that he was the fittest person to pursue the dialogue. Mr. Sykes, thus mutely appealed to, and possibly feeling his personal pride and influence, interested in the immediate reduction of Miss Nancy to reason, gave utterance to about a couple of score of curses and threats, the rapid production of which reflected great credit on the fertility of his invention. As they produced no visible effect on the object against whom they were discharged, however, he resorted to more tangible arguments. "'What do you mean by this?' said Sykes backing the inquiry with a very common imprecation concerning the most beautiful of human features, which, if it were heard above, only once out of every fifty thousand times that it is uttered below, would render blindness as common a disorder as measles. "'What do you mean by it? Burn my body! Do you know who you are, and what you are?' "'Oh, yes! I know all about it!' replied the girl, laughing hysterically and shaking her head from side to side, with a poor assumption of indifference. "'Well, then, keep quiet,' rejoined Sykes, with a growl like that he was accustomed to use when addressing his dog, "'or I'll quiet you for a good long time to come.' The girl laughed again, even less composedly than before, and, darting a hasty look at Sykes, turned her face aside, and bit her lip till the blood came. 
"'You're a nice one,' added Sykes, as he surveyed her with a contemptuous air, "'to take up the humane and genteel side. A pretty subject for the child, as you call him, to make a friend of.' "'God Almighty, help me, I am,' cried the girl passionately, "'and I wish I'd been struck dead in the street, or had changed places with them we pass so near to-night.' before i lent a hand in bringing him here he's a thief a liar a devil all that's bad from this night forth isn't that enough for the old wretch without blows come come sykes said the jew appealing to him in a remonstratory tone and motioning towards the boys who were eagerly attentive to all that passed we must have civil words civil words bill "'Civil words!' cried the girl, whose passion was frightful to see. "'Civil words! You villain! Yes, you deserve him from me. I thieved for you when I was a child, not half as old as this,' pointing to Oliver. "'I've been in the same trade, and in the same service for twelve years since. Don't you know it? Speak out! Don't you know it?' "'Well, well,' replied the Jew with an attempt at pacification. "'And if you have, it's your living.' "'Ay, it is,' returned the girl, not speaking, but pouring out the words in one continuous and vehement scream. "'It is my living, and the cold, wet, dirty streets are my home, and you're the wretch that drove me to them long ago, and that'll keep me there day and night, day and night, till I die.' "'I shall do you a mischief.' interposed the Jew, goaded by these reproaches, and mischief worse than that, if you say much more. The girl said nothing more, but tearing her hair and dress in a transport of passion, made such a rush at the Jew, as would probably have left signal marks of her revenge upon him, had not her wrists been seized by sights at the right moment, upon which she made a few ineffectual struggles, and fainted. "'She's all right now,' said Sykes laying her down in a corner. She's uncommon strong in the arms when she's up in this way." The Jew wiped his forehead, and smiled, as if it were a relief to have the disturbance over. But neither he, nor Sykes, nor the dog, nor the boys, seemed to consider it in any other light than a common occurrence incidental to business. "'It's the worst of having to do with women,' said the Jew, replacing his club but they're clever, and we can't get on in our line without him. Charlie, show Oliver to bed. I suppose he'd better not wear his best clothes to-morrow, Fagin, had he? inquired Charlie Bates. Certainly not, replied the Jew, reciprocating the grin with which Charlie put the question. Master Bates, apparently much delighted with his commission, took the cleft stick, and led Oliver into an adjacent kitchen, where there were two or three of the beds on which he had slept before, and here, with many uncontrollable bursts of laughter, he produced the identical old suit of clothes which Oliver had so much congratulated himself upon leaving off at Mr. Brownlow's, and the accidental display of which, to Fagin, by the Jew who purchased them, had been the very first clue received of his whereabout. "'Put off the smart ones!' said Charlie, and I'll give him to Fagin to take care of. Oh, what fun it is! Poor Oliver unwillingly complied. Master Bates, rolling up the new clothes under his arm, departed from the room, leaving Oliver in the dark, and locking the door behind him. The noise of Charlie's laughter, and the voice of Miss Betsy, who opportunely arrived to throw water over her friend, and perform other feminine offices for the promotion of her recovery, might have kept many people awake under more happy circumstances than those in which Oliver was placed, but he was sick and weary, and he soon fell sound asleep. End of chapter 16「Chapter 17 of Oliver Twist This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Seventeen. Oliver's destiny continuing unpropitious, 
brings a great man to London to injure his reputation. It is the custom on the stage, in all good murderous melodramas, to present the tragic and the comic scenes, in as regular alternation as the layers of red and white in a side of streaky bacon. The hero sinks upon his straw bed, weighed down by fetters and misfortunes. In the next scene, his faithful but unconscious squire regales the audience with a comic song. We behold, with throbbing bosoms, the heroine in the grasp of a proud and ruthless baron, her virtue and her life alike in danger, drawing forth her dagger to preserve the one at the cost of the other. And just as our expectations are wrought up to the highest pitch, a whistle is heard, and we are straightway transported to the great hall of the castle, where a grey-headed seneschal sings a funny chorus with a funnier body of vassals, who are free of all sorts of places, from church vaults to palaces, and roam about in company, carolling perpetually. Such changes appear absurd, but they are not so unnatural as they would seem at first sight. The transitions in real life, from well-spread boards to death-beds, and from mourning weeds to holiday garments, are not a whit less startling. Only there we are busy actors instead of passive lookers-on, which makes a vast difference. The actors in the mimic life of the theatre are blind to violent transitions and abrupt impulses of passion or feeling, which, presented before the eyes of mere spectators, are at once condemned as outrageous and preposterous. As sudden shiftings of the scene, and rapid changes of time and place, are not only sanctioned in books by long usage, but are by many considered as the great art of authorship, an author's skill in his craft being, by such critics, chiefly estimated with relation to the dilemmas in which he leaves his characters at the end of every chapter. This brief introduction to the present one may perhaps be deemed unnecessary. If so, let it be considered a delicate intimation on the part of the historian that he is going back to the town in which Oliver Twist was born, the reader taking it for granted that there are good and substantial reasons for making the journey, or he would not be invited to proceed upon such an expedition. Mr. Bumble emerged at early morning from the workhouse gate, and walked with portly carriage and commanding steps up the high street. He was in the full bloom and pride of beadlehood. His cocked hat and coat were dazzling in the morning sun. He clutched his cane with the vigorous tenacity of health and power. Mr. Bumble always carried his head high, but this morning it was higher than usual. There was an abstraction in his eye, an elevation in his air, which might have warned an observant stranger that thoughts were passing in the beadle's mind too great for utterance. Mr. Bumble stopped not to converse with the small shopkeepers and others who spoke to him deferentially as he passed along. He merely returned their salutations with a wave of his hand, and relaxed not in his dignified pace, until he reached the farm where Mrs. Mann tended the infant paupers with parochial care. "'Drat that beadle!' said Mrs. Mann, hearing the well-known shaking at the garden gate, "'if it isn't him at this time in the morning!' "'Look, Mr. Bumble, only think of its being you. <laughs> well, dear me, it is a pleasure, this is. Come into the parlour, sir, please.' The first sentence was addressed to Susan, and the exclamations of delight were uttered to Mr. Bumble, as the good lady unlocked the garden gate, and showed him, with great attention and respect, into the house. "'Mrs. Mann,' said Mr. Bumble, not sitting upon, or dropping himself into a seat as any common jackanapes would, but letting himself gradually and slowly down into a chair. "'Mrs. Mann, ma'am, good morning.' "'Well, <laughs> and good morning to you, sir,' replied Mrs. Mann, with many smiles, "'and hoping you find yourself well, sir.' "'So, so, Mrs. Mann,' replied the beadle, "'a parochial life is not a bed of roses, Mrs. Mann.' "'Ah! Oh, that it isn't indeed, Mr. Bumble,' rejoined the lady, and all the infant paupers might have chorused the rejoinder with great propriety, if they had heard it. "'A parochial life, ma'am,' continued Mr. Bumble, striking the table with his cane, "'is a life of worrit, and vexation, and hardihood. But all public characters, as I may say, 
must suffer prosecution. Mrs. Mann, not very well knowing what the beadle meant, raised her hands with a look of sympathy, and sighed. "'Ah, you may well sigh, Mrs. Mann,' said the beadle. Finding she had done right, Mrs. Mann sighed again, evidently to the satisfaction of the public character, who, repressing a complacent smile by looking sternly at his cocked hat, said, "'Mrs. Mann, I am going to London.' "'Look, Mr. Bumble!' cried Mrs. Mann, starting back. "'To London, ma'am,' resumed the inflexible beadle, "'by coach. I and two paupers, Mrs. Mann. A legal action is a-coming on about a settlement, and the board has appointed me—me, me, Mrs. Mann—to dispose to the matter before the quarter sessions at Clark Inwell. "'And I very much question,' added Mr. Bumble, drawing himself up, "'whether the Clark Inwell sessions will not find themselves in the wrong box before they have done with me.' "'Oh, you mustn't be too hard upon them, sir,' said Mrs. Mann, coaxingly. "'The Clark Inwell sessions have brought it upon themselves, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'And if the Clark Inwell sessions—' find that they come off rather worse than they expected. The clock in well sessions have only themselves to thank." There was so much determination and depth of purpose about the menacing manner in which Mr. Bumble delivered himself of these words, that Mrs. Mann appeared quite awed by them. At length she said, "'You're going my coach, sir? I thought it was always usual to send them paupers in carts.' "'That's when they're ill, Mrs. Mann said the beadle. We put the sick paupers into open carts in the rainy weather to prevent their taking cold. Oh, said Mrs. Mann, the opposition coach contracts for these two, and takes them cheap, said Mr. Bumble. They are both in a very low state, and we find it would come two pound cheaper to move them at the burium. That is, if we can throw them upon another parish, which I think we shall be able to do, if they don't die upon the road to spite us." <laughs> when Mr. Bumble had laughed a little while, his eyes again encountered the cocked hat, and he became grave. "'We are forgetting business, ma'am,' said the beadle. "'Here is your parochial stipend for the month.' Mr. Bumble produced some silver money, rolled up in paper, from his pocket-book, and requested a receipt, which Mrs. Mann wrote. "'It's very much blotted, sir,' said the farmer of infants. "'But it's formal enough, I dare say.' "'Thank you, Mr. Bumble, sir. I'm very much obliged to you, I'm sure.' Mr. Bumble nodded, blandly, in acknowledgment of Mrs. Mann's curtsy, and inquired how the children were. "'Bless their dear little hearts,' said Mrs. Mann, with emotion. "'They're as well as can be, the dears. Of course, except the two that died last week, and little Dick." "'Isn't that boy no better?' inquired Mr. Bumble. Mrs. Mann shook her head. "'He's a ill-conditioned, wishes, bad-disposed, parochial child, that,' said Mr. Bumble angrily. "'Where is he?' "'I'll bring him to you in one minute, sir,' replied Mrs. Mann. "'Here! You! Dick!' After some calling, Dick was discovered. Having had his face put under the pump, and dried upon Mrs. Mann's gown, he was led into the awful presence of Mr. Bumble, the beadle. The child was pale and thin, his cheeks were sunken, and his eyes large and bright. The scanty parish dress, the livery of his misery, hung loosely on his feeble body, and his young limbs had wasted away like those of an old man. Such was the little being who stood trembling beneath Mr. Bumble's glance, not daring to lift his eyes from the floor, and dreading even to hear the beadle's voice. "'Can't you look at the gentleman, you obstinate boy?' said Mrs. Mann. The child meekly raised his eyes, and encountered those of Mr. Bumble. "'What's the matter with you, parochial Dick?' inquired Mr. Bumble, with well-timed jocularity. "'Nothing, sir.' replied the child faintly. "'I should think not,' 
said Mrs. Mann, who had, of course, laughed very much at Mr. Bumble's humour. "'You want for nothing, I'm sure.' "'I should like—' faltered the child. "'Hey, Day!' interposed Mrs. Mann. "'I suppose you're going to say that you do want for something now. Why, you little wretch!' "'Stop, Mrs. Mann, stop,' said the beadle, raising his hand with a show of authority. "'Like what, sir, eh?' "'I should like,' faltered the child, "'if somebody that can write would put a few words down for me on a piece of paper, and fold it up, and seal it and keep it for me after i'm laid in the ground why what does the boy mean exclaimed mr bumble on whom the earnest manner and one aspect of the child had made some impression accustomed as he was to such things what do you mean sir i should like said the child to leave my dear love to poor oliver twist and to let him know how often I've sat by myself and cried to think of his wandering about in the dark nights with nobody to help him, and I should like to tell him," said the child, pressing his small hands together and speaking with great fervour, that I was glad to die when i was very young for perhaps if i had lived to be a man and had grown old my little sister who is in heaven might forget me or be unlike me and it would be so much happier if we were both children there together mr bumble surveyed the little speaker from head to foot with indescribable astonishment, and turning to his companion, said, "'They're all in one story, Mrs. Mann. That audacious Oliver had demogalized them all.' "'I couldn't have believed it, sir,' said Mrs. Mann, holding up her hands and looking malignantly at Dick. "'I never see such a hardened little wretch.' "'Take him away, ma'am.' said Mr. Bumble, imperiously. This must be stated to the board, Mrs. Mann. "'I hope the gentleman will understand that it isn't my fault, sir,' said Mrs. Mann, whimpering pathetically. "'They shall understand that, ma'am. They shall be acquainted with the true state of the case,' said Mr. Bumble. "'There, take him away. I can't bear the sight on him.' Dick was immediately taken away, and locked up in the coal cellar. Mr. Bumble shortly afterwards took himself off to prepare for his journey. At six o'clock next morning, Mr. Bumble, having exchanged his cocked hat for a round one, and encased his person in a blue greatcoat with a cape to it, took his place on the outside of the coach, accompanied by the criminals whose settlement was disputed, with whom in due course of time he arrived in London. He experienced no other crosses on the way than those which originated in the perverse behaviour of the two paupers, who persisted in shivering and complaining of the cold, in a manner which Mr. Bumble declared caused his teeth to chatter in his head, and made him feel quite uncomfortable, although he had a great coat on. Having disposed of these evil-minded persons for the night, Mr. Bumble sat himself down in the house at which the coach stopped, and took a temperate dinner of steaks, oyster-sauce, and porter. Putting a glass of hot gin and water on the chimney-piece, he drew his chair to the fire, and, with sundry moral reflections on the too prevalent sin of discontent and complaining, composed himself to read the paper. The very first paragraph, upon which Mr. Bumble's eye rested, was the following advertisement. Five Guineas Reward Whereas a young boy, named Oliver Twist, absconded, or was enticed, on Thursday evening last, from his home at Pentonville, and has not since been heard of. The above reward will be paid to any person who will give such information as will lead to the discovery of the said Oliver Twist, or tend to throw any light upon his previous history, in which the advertiser is, for many reasons, warmly interested. 
and then followed a full description of Oliver's dress, person, appearance, and disappearance, with the name and address of Mr. Brownlow at full length. Mr. Bumble opened his eyes, read the advertisement, slowly and carefully, three several times, and in something more than five minutes was on his way to Pentonville, having actually, in his excitement, left a glass of hot gin and water untasted. "'Is Mr. Brownlow at home?' inquired Mr. Bumble of the girl who opened the door. To this inquiry the girl returned the not uncommon, but rather evasive reply of, "'I don't know. Where do you come from?' Mr. Bumble no sooner uttered Oliver's name, an explanation of his errand, than Mrs. Bedwin, who had been listening at the parlour door, hastened into the passage in a breathless state. "'Come in! Come in!' said the old lady. "'I knew we should hear of him. Poor dear! I knew we should. I was certain of it. Bless his heart! I said so all along.' Having heard this, the worthy old lady hurried back into the parlour again, and seating herself on a sofa, burst into tears. The girl, who was not quite so susceptible, had run upstairs meanwhile, and now returned with a request that Mr. Bumble would follow her immediately, which he did. He was shown into the little back study, where sat Mr. Brownlow and his friend Mr. Grimwig, with decanters and glasses before them. The latter gentleman at once burst into the exclamation, "'A beadle! A parish beadle, or I'll eat my head!' "'Pray don't interrupt just now,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'Take a seat, will you?' Mr. Bumble sat himself down, quite confounded by the oddity of Mr. Grimwig's manner. Mr. Brownlow moved the lamp, so as to obtain an uninterrupted view of the beadle's countenance, and said, with a little impatience, "'Now, sir, you come in consequence of having seen the advertisement?' "'Yes, sir,' said Mr. Bumble. "'And you are a beadle, are you not?' inquired Mr. Grimwig. "'I am a parochial beadle, gentlemen,' returned Mr. Bumble proudly. "'Of course,' observed Mr. Grimwig aside to his friend. "'I knew he was. A beadle all over.' Mr. Brownlow gently shook his head to impose silence on his friend, and resumed. "'Do you know where this poor boy is now?' "'No more than nobody,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'Well, what do you know of him?' inquired the old gentleman. "'Speak out, my friend, if you have anything to say. What do you know of him?' "'You don't happen to know any good of him, do you?' said Mr. Grimwig, caustically, after an attentive perusal of Mr. Bumble's features. Mr. Bumble, catching at the inquiry very quickly, shook his head with portentous solemnity. "'You see,' said Mr. Grimwig, looking triumphantly at Mr. Brownlow, Mr. Brownlow looked apprehensively at Mr. Bumble's pursed-up countenance, and requested him to communicate what he knew regarding Oliver, in as few words as possible. Mr. Bumble put down his hat, unbuttoned his coat, folded his arms, inclined his head in a retrospective manner, and, after a few moments' reflection, commenced his story. It would be tedious, if given in the beadle's words, occupying as it did some twenty minutes in the telling, but the sum and substance of it was that Oliver was a foundling, born of low and vicious parents, that he had from his birth displayed no better qualities than treachery, ingratitude, and malice, that he had terminated his brief career in the place of his birth by making a sanguinary and cowardly attack on an unoffending lad, and running away in the night-time from his master's house. In proof of his really being the person he represented himself, Mr. Bumble laid upon the table the papers he had brought to town. Folding his arms again, he then awaited Mr. Brownlow's observations. "'I fear it is all too true,' said the old gentleman sorrowfully, after looking over the papers. "'This is not much for your intelligence, but I would gladly have given you treble the money, if it had been favourable to the boy.' "'It is not improbable.' that if Mr. Bumble had been possessed of this information at an earlier period of the interview, he might have imparted a very different colouring to his little history. It was too late to do it now, however, so he shook his head gravely, and, pocketing the five guineas, withdrew. Mr. Brownlow paced the room to and fro for some minutes, evidently so much disturbed by the beadle's tale, 
that even Mr. Grimwig forbore to vex him further. At length he stopped, and rang the bell violently. "'Mrs. Bedwin,' said Mr. Brownlow, when the housekeeper appeared, "'that boy, Oliver, is an impostor. "'It can't be, sir. It cannot be,' said the old lady energetically. "'I tell you he is,' retorted the old gentleman. "'What do you mean by can't be? "'We have just heard a full account of him from his birth, "'and he has been a thorough-paced little villain all his life.' "'I never will believe it, sir,' replied the old lady firmly. "'Never!' "'You old women never believe anything but quack doctors and lying story-books,' growled Mr. Grimwig. "'I knew it all along. Why didn't you take my advice in the beginning? You would, if he hadn't had fever, I suppose, eh? He was interesting, wasn't he? Interesting? Pah!' And Mr. Grimwig poked the fire with a flourish. "'He was a dear, grateful, gentle child, sir.' retorted Mrs. Bedwin indignantly. I know what children are, sir, and have done these forty years. And people who can't say the same shouldn't say anything about them. That's my opinion." This was a hard hit at Mr. Grimwig, who was a bachelor. As it extorted nothing from that gentleman but a smile, the old lady tossed her head, and smoothed down her apron, preparatory to another speech, when she was stopped by Mr. Brownlow. Silence said the old gentleman, feigning an anger he was far from feeling. "'Never let me hear the boy's name again. I rang to tell you that. Never, never on any pretense, mind. You may leave the room, Mrs. Bedwin. Remember, I am in earnest.' There were sad hearts at Mr. Brownlow's that night. Oliver's heart sank within him when he thought of his good friends. It was well for him that he could not know what they had heard, or it might have broken outright. End of chapter 17